name. But the Lord said, go for, Saul, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight and then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Well, there's an idiom in our uh, language that we call, uh, we call, we say when people have a big experience, we call it a Damascus Road experience. Well, this is where that came from, quite obviously. This is the original Damascus Road experience. Jesus appears to Saul, who was persecuting Christians, uh, but Jesus did whatever it took to get Saul's attention. Saul must have been pretty thick-headed, just like a lot of us sometimes, because Jesus literally knocked him to his knees with a bright light and, and with some temporary blindness. And we tend to focus on what happened to Saul, and that is absolutely the main focus of this passage. Saul did say yes to Jesus, and of course we know that we have uh, lots of our New Testament because of Saul, and he eventually was renamed Paul. But one of the less remembered parts of this account happens while Saul was still blinded. And God needed someone to be an important link in the chain of events that leading to Paul's transformation. So Jesus appears to another person, a disciple whose name was Ananias. Now, this is not the same Ananias that we met a few weeks ago. Um, he and his wife Sapphira lied to God, and you remember that dramatic story. This is an Ananias that lived in Damascus. And Jesus came to him in a dream. And, and, and he said to Ananias, uh, Ananias, this is Jesus. And the first words that we have recorded that came from Ananias are the words, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Now, note that Ananias was very much a human being. He says yes before Jesus even gives him the task. Uh, Jesus and when he does give him the task, he responds back and says, uh, Jesus, are you sure you've got the right guy? Because this guy's been killing your followers. And, and me, I'm not the right guy to go to him. Um, he's infamous for doing terrible things to Christians, getting them arrested. And as the first verse of the passage just said, uh, also that he was, he was even, even in, instrumental in their death. Think about it. In our day, if Jesus nudged you towards someone, uh, and we've heard about people in the world all the time, someone who was being very hostile towards Christians, would you have the courage to say yes? Would you have the courage to go and have the conversation with him? Jesus said to Ananias, he said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument. Saul is my chosen instrument. Ananias did go, and he found Saul, and he prayed for him, and he regained his sight, and Saul began talking with people about the resurrected Jesus, and we have, as I said, we have much of our New Testament because of uh, the fact that Saul said yes, and Ananias said yes to go talk to him. This happens all the time in the book of Acts. Uh, a little bit later, Paul and Silas are very sure that God is leading them this way. They are to stay in Asia Minor. They are to stay in, 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 the, in the part of the world we commonly call Turkey today. And, 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 and Paul was absolutely positive that that was the way that he was to go. Uh, and, and yet, uh, Paul had a vision one night of a man from Macedonia which is in northeastern Greece, would have, which meant that he was going to have to cross over the water, a, a little bit of water, and, and get into a, a brand new area, a place where the gospel had not ever gone before. The man called them to cross over and into the first major city that they went into was the, the city of Philippi. And of course, we know we have a letter to the Philippians from Paul. Uh, and once again, this was a change to their agenda. They knew absolutely positively in their minds that they were to stay in Asia because that's where they had been for the, all this time. And yet, they eventually said yes. 
And God used their yes to bring the good news of Jesus into Europe for the first time. And of course, we know that uh, it, 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 it spread all over the place. Now, throughout this time in the book of Acts, we have learned that there is a God who can do anything. Just like the song we sang, he absolutely can do anything. And sometimes he does the, the things that we don't expect. And Paul later uses words in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, God is able to do incredibly more than we could ever ask or imagine amazingly more than we could ever ask or imagine. And it just lets us know that God is constantly at work, constantly inviting us. You come here. I want to use you here. I have a plan for you. Big things, small things. And we have to learn to say the first thing that Ananias said to Paul, or to, to, to the Lord, which was, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. If we want to be blessed, we need, we need to learn to say, Yes, Lord. Uh, when God, excuse me, when God whispers to us, we want to say yes. If we want to live in peace, if we want to have that peace that passes all understanding. If when God whispers that to us, we need to say yes. If we want to experience God's presence more fully, when God whispers to us, we need to learn to say yes. And it's in our yes that God is going to do supernatural things. I think God's whispering to you today. I think God is whispering to us all the time. What are you hearing? What are you hearing right now? Now, <laughs> maybe you're like me, but I hear lots of voices every day. <laughs> um, how about you? Sometimes it's just me talking to myself. Sometimes it might be God. Sometimes it could be the devil. Sometimes it could be my meal last night, whatever that might have been. Uh, we want to say yes, but we only want to say yes to God. Yes to God. We need to learn to learn. We need to learn to discern. 1 John 4.1 says this, uh, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in this world. There are many voices that are going to try to lead us down deceptive paths. A personal question this morning, I think it's the place where all this starts, is asking the question, do you really want to know what God is saying to you? Do you really, do you really want to know what God's saying to you? I think we can say, absolutely, yes, positively, I do, but at some time or another, we pull back and say, well, I'd kind of rather do sort of what Paul and Silas wanted to do. I want to stick by my agenda rather than listen to the, the voice that's telling me to go elsewhere. That's a sign of love for God. It's a sign of trust for God, seeking His will first and foremost, no matter what it is. Now, this morning what I want to do with the rest of our time is to go through uh, five different ways that the Bible gives us to test or to form a kind of a filter for the different impressions that we get. Now, these are things we've talked about before. Uh, this is not going to be rocket science at all. It's going to be more of a reminder. And maybe it, if you have the notes in front of you, it's going to be a place for you to put in your Bible and uh, to have it all in one place. And so if there are are things that you need to review from now and, now and then, or if you're, you're getting voices and you're trying to discern what God's saying, maybe you can go and use the filters that, that, that we're going to look at this morning. The first and the most obvious one is, does it agree with the Bible? Does it agree with the Bible? Messages that contradict Scripture are not from God. That seems so obvious, but yet sometimes we say, well, you know, Things have changed, times have changed, things like that. And it's like, no. Truth does not change. God is consistent and does not change his mind. God's word does not change. Luke 21 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, opinions and technology changes, doesn't it? Uh, think of the state of the art. Think of what was state of the art in 2006. And now... That's gone in 2016. Think of the changes that have taken place in cell phones over the past 10 years. I went back to 25 years ago 
cell phones were very few and far between. And now they are the chief source of entertainment for most of us, for many of us, as we stare at them during our idle time and get the latest news and get the latest, latest updates. Opinions and technology change all the time, but truth does not change. Truth does not change. Many people years ago were convinced that the world was flat. Well, they were wrong then. It was never flat. They were just plain wrong. The truth did not change. Uh, they happened to be wrong. In Romans 13, 6, God tells us to pay our taxes. Jesus also says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. If someone says God told them not to honestly pay their taxes, that's not from God. That's not from God. Double underline that. Don't say yes to that voice. In Proverbs and other places, God instructs us to do business with integrity. God does not tell us to ever be dishonest, even if it means we lose profits. We can always count on God's word. God does not contradict or add to what he's already said. So much of what we need to know about God's will is already there. It's in the Bible. That's why we talk about it's so important for us to read the Bible, to, to connect with God, to, to do our 16 minutes with God in 2016 because that's how we're going to stay, stay close, stay refreshed. The second filter, um, moving right along, says does it, the answer is the question, does it make me more like Jesus? Does this voice, does, does this impression that I get, would it make me more like Jesus? Galatians 4.19 tells us that that is the goal that God has for each of us until Christ is fully developed in each of our lives. That's our goal, to become more like Christ, that he would be fully developed in us. Now, we each have these hundred years or so on earth, don't we, that our character is God calls, calls us to, 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 to really work with him so that our character can be more like Christ's character. Jesus went through lots of tough things when he was here on this earth, and so will we. That's a part of the refining process. In this world, Jesus said, I promise you, you will have character-building circumstances. There's another word for that, for character-building circumstances. It's called trouble. Trouble. He says, I promise you there will be trouble. There just will be. We live in an imperfect world. It's beautiful in so many ways, but as we've talked about before, it's broken. Relationships become broken because our default mode is to be selfish. Even the weather and the environment are broken. But we also know, as we talked about several weeks ago, heaven will be a perfect place. Here we fight the consequences of sin. The fight grows our character. It does not make us more comfortable, that's for sure. But it grows our character. Ephesians 4 has one of the many, many, many descriptive passages in Scripture that Jesus calls us to remember. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. He gives us these two lists. He says, these things are not motivated. There are some things that are not motivated by God and there are some things that are motivated from God. For instance, the voice that calls me to rage or to speak harsh words to my spouse or my child or for that matter, anyone. Folks, that voice is not from God. That's not from God. We can know that for sure. The voice that says, I have a good juicy story about someone to expose them and so that we can all have a good laugh. Is that from God? Absolutely not. Say no to those voices. Those are not from God. Those will be nothing, nothing but trouble. <clears throat> the voice that tells me to apologize to my wife or husband or to my friend or, or to forgive them, even though... I feel like I'm 95% right and they're 5% wrong. <laughs> or to do anything that is there to get the relationship right again. That's a voice we need to say yes to because we know that is from God. Does it make me more like Jesus? Does it make me more like Jesus? That's the second filter. The third one involves all of us together. Does my church family confirm it? 
Does my church family confirm it? We need each other. And especially we need other mature Jesus followers in our life. We need our own personal board of directors where we can bounce off our impressions. Uh, Proverbs 11:14 says it this way. It says, there is safety in having many counselors. Now, there's an asterisk to that, to that particular passage because uh, we all know that we can always find someone to agree with us about anything, can't we? We can always find someone to agree with us about anything, even, even the wrong direction. But if we really want to find truth, we need to find some people who are trying to follow Christ and trying to live the life that God's given to us and ask them to be part of our life. Allow them to help you test the impressions that you're getting in your life because you're more likely to get the truth at that point. Fourth one, fourth of our filters, is it consistent with how God has wired me up? God's wired us all up very uniquely to prepare us for something that matches our wiring, to use electrical terms this morning for, for each of us. But Ephesians 2 says this, it says, for we are, we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand to be our way of life. Um, when I was 28, many of you know that um, I was sensing a call at that point. God was trying to speak to me uh, about, my, about my career. My education and ex previous experience had prepared me to climb, to continue climbing the accounting and finance ladder. I, had a, I, I really liked what I was doing a lot. But in my heart, in my heart, I, I was hearing this man, sort of like the man from Macedonia, talking to me. And, 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 and God was calling me in a different direction. God was bringing me to a fork in the road. I always remember when I hear that phrase, fork in the road, I always remember what Yogi Berra said. He said, when you come to the fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> Well, I did. I sought the counsel of more than Yogi Berra, of, of, of some wise Christians in my life, and including my parents. And those wise Christians helped me enormously. However, uh, let's just add some more grist to the story a little bit. At, at that time in my life, I also had a, a love for sports and for basketball. Um, I could have said, you know, I love basketball an awful lot, and I think God's calling me to the NBA. What do you think? What do you think? Now, I hope those good friends, those board of director friends of mine, would have said to me, Paul, I think you have your wires crossed. Think YMCA. That's a good place for that. Think YMCA. Now, now some of you who are trying to figure out how God has wired you up, listen for his voice. Listen to the godly people in your life. Michael and I even have some tools to help you. Uh, follow opportunities. You might even go down some dead-end paths. But that's okay. That's the, that's the way it works in life. This is not just for young people. We have people in our community who have kept on listening to God throughout their life and even after their first career ended. God has given them a dream and a new chapter in their life, a new ministry setting. Uh, they have switched from, from one venue to another. And, and now, uh, you might call this a later in life opportunity. So there are places to serve all over where there are needs, where this can make a difference. This fall, we're going to be building another house in Mexico. Maybe God, maybe that's the first thing that God's going to call you to be a part of. We have some opportunities, as Pastor Michael said at the beginning, for people to teach Sunday school right now. It's an awesome opportunity to have the children bless you. Can you say that this morning, VBS leaders? Uh, it is an amazing thing thing to have God's word come back to you in the form of the voices of little children. It is, it, it is such an encouraging time. I pray that you will listen and over time I know he's going to lead you wherever he's, wherever he's supposed to, wherever you're supposed to go. Remember though that God wired you up and you are one of a kind and he has a plan for you. Now the last of the filters is this and this is the one that's a little bit harder to grasp, but it's also vital. Do I sense God's peace about it? 
After working through all of the filters, the, the first four, then we ask the question, do I feel a peace? Do I feel God's peace? Now, if you're still feeling confused, um, it might be a change in life. Or, a, or location. It might be a money purchase thing that you're trying to decide. It might be a college choice. God's voice does eventually, I believe, bring peace. It might be foggy at first. It might be foggy at first, but the Holy Spirit will bring clarity. The most direct passage about this is one that many of us use every single day. Philippians 4, 6, where the Apostle Paul says, Don't worry about anything. But instead, pray about everything. God, Tell God what you need. Thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. He gives us peace as we live in Christ Jesus, which means as we obey Him. Life is a journey. It's full of all sorts of circumstances, all sorts of decisions. But I've decided, and I think you have too, I always want to listen for God's voice. And when I hear God's voice, I always want to say yes to whatever God says. I want to be a pastor who listens to God to, to lead in and to encourage and to challenge and to discern where God is leading us. His parents, Betsy and I, we want to continue to listening to God's voice, to, to saying yes so we can encourage our children, Sarah, David, and Daniel, to learn and to listen so they will be able to say yes to God's call in their life. Love the end of the verse, verse end of the verses in the Sermon on the, on the Mount. Jesus is giving us a parable, and, and he says this. He begins the parable with this. He says, Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. And then he goes on to tell the story about the man who built his house upon the rock and the man who built his house upon the sand. I want us to close today as we've been closing over these last few weeks with some quiet time. I want to, just to ask you three questions this morning for us to ponder. The first one is, what is God saying you, to you today? What is God saying to you today? What is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to do? I want you to spend some time with me. Maybe God's saying, I want you to spend some time with me. Maybe that's the simple thing. We've been distant for a while. Maybe God's saying, start doing this, whatever this is. Or stop doing this, whatever this is. If you start doing this, it'll give you joy. If you stop doing this, it'll, it'll, it'll keep you from destroying your life and your relationships. Maybe he's saying, invest in your family. Maybe he's saying, I want you to lead something, and you know what that is. Maybe he's saying, I want you to be a teacher. Or maybe he's saying to some of us this morning, I want you to get some help. I want you to get some help. What do you sense God saying to you today? And then, of course, where do we need to say yes to God? Join me. I'm just going to start our prayer time and then we're going to have some time for silence and then I'll close in a prayer.